stop video and mute. And thanks again. <laughs> All right, I'm um, letting people in. So um, yeah, we're ready to go. I see some familiar names on there. Hey, Dane, how you doing? Oh, you're muted, Dane. Hey, how are you, Professor? I'm doing all right. Just make it Jeff. That's okay. <laughs> I know. I, I, you know, old habits die hard. Dean here. No, it's Cohen. What's up? It's Dorian. Hey, Dorian. How are you? I had a hard time. You were breaking up a little bit there. Yeah, she's having, I think, some connection issues. Oh, no. I just left uh, Wade Mackey's. Zoom presentation. Interesting. Interesting uh, insight. Yep. Hello. I see all kinds of faces on here. So. Sam, should I go ahead and start? Yeah. If you wanted to go ahead and get started, that'd be great. OK. All right, cool. Well, for those of you who don't know me, let me introduce myself uh, just very quickly and um, and just sort of walk you through what this is going to look like uh, for an hour or less, just depending on how, how far y'all want to go. Uh, my name is Jeff Colbert. I'm a senior lecturer in political science at UNCG. Uh, this past January, I started my 33rd year teaching here, uh, and I am an alumnus of UNCG. I graduated I finished my, my bachelor's in 1984 um, because I dropped out of school in the 70s and came back as an adult student. Uh, and my BA was in political science and then moved into the master's of public affairs program here, graduated in May of 86 and taught my first class here in January of 88 and have been teaching ever since. The university can't get rid of me. I'm not quite sure what their problem is, but I would think by now they could have figured out how to do that. Um, but anyway, I teach mostly um, entry level classes. I am an Americanist. I spend uh, my, I teach an intro American government, public policy, um, different courses, uh, some other courses related to that, a political issues course. Um, but that's typically what I what I teach at UNCG and uh, have been um, active in the Alumni Association for the last dozen years or so. I was uh, president of the Alumni Association one year, served on the board for several years. Um, and now I just spend most of my time doing my very best to irritate college students. And apparently I'm incredibly successful at it. So, uh, so good deal. Um, so the deal here, I think, is that I'm supposed to talk about what's coming up in elections. Um, and as I was sharing with Sam and Dorian before we started, um, I'm looking forward mostly to getting questions from y'all. Uh, understanding that pretty much any question you ask me is going to begin with the answer, I don't know. Um, because politics is crazy in any kind of normal setting. And as certainly all of you know, there is nothing normal about the setting that we're in right now. So answers will typically begin with, I don't know, but, and then try as best I can to tell you what I think. Um, and in a limited number of cases, what I know. Um, and we just sort of go from there. Um, I am perfectly confident with saying, uh, I don't know an answer to a question. Uh, none of us know everything. Some people try to act like they do. I never joined that group. Um, and so, you know, sometimes I tell students, I don't know, good question. I don't know the answer. And so some of y'all will probably get that as well, uh, but I'll do my best. Um, so just a couple of quick comments. Um, this is obviously an unusual year in terms of how um, the uh, coronavirus has changed campaigning. Uh, we would be in the midst at this moment of just being inundated with commercials, with campaign appearances across the country uh, by both the president and now by uh, former Vice President Biden. Uh, they would be in full campaign mode um, and just spending 
by the time we get to the end of November, probably two to three billion dollars between the between the two of them on the campaign. Um, and obviously, neither of them uh, have the ability to do that right now. They can both do virtual. And of course, President Trump is on the news uh, pretty much every weekday with an update on what's going on with the, the virus. Um, and it'll be interesting to see how that impacts his, his election prospects as well. That might be one of the questions we can talk about. Um, the Democrats have already moved their convention. It was scheduled to be in July in Milwaukee, and they moved it to the middle of August. And the Republican convention, which will be in Charlotte, will be the week right after that. Um, uh, the Democrats meet the 17th through the 20th, and the Republicans are the 24th through the 27th. Um, so the Democrats have planned to get an early start this year, and that's not going to work out. Um, but, uh, but anyway, so that's probably enough babbling from me. I would love to hear questions, um, comments, whatever. Um, you'll find uh, that I, do, I don't get partisan. Uh, I like to, to just, you know, we all have our own views, but I try to keep those sort of close. So, so who you're going to vote for is not an I don't know. It's a I won't tell you question. Um, but beyond that, I'll talk about most anything. So who wants to start? I see lots of muted buttons, but somebody unmute and talk. This could be the shortest session in alumni affairs history. <laughs> Hi, Professor Colbert. It's Hannah Lynch over in DC. I just, hey, I wanted to pop in and just say hello. And I am excited that you guys were doing this. How are you doing up in DC? Um, I'm okay. Uh, we are, I mean, we are shut down, shut down because um, we've been a hot spot. So, right. um, and I, started a new job. I'm working at a patient advocacy organization. So we're actively trying to get some of our issues added into the next round of relief legislation. So keeping me busy. Yeah. Are you doing most all of your work online? Yes, I, I'm constantly on calls and doing stuff online. I've got a nice little setup here. So we're doing a virtual fly-in for some of our advocates and they're doing phone calls with Hill folks next week. Um, right. where normally that would be in person. So that's been really interesting. Um, <laughs> trying to coordinate all of that, but yeah, trying to adapt and do the best we can under the circumstances. So I hope you and your wife are staying well and doing okay down there. So far. Yeah. I think things are going, going pretty well. Can't complain. Greensboro and our area has been not as hard hit as some other places. Um, so we're, that's a blessing in and of itself. But, but you, know, you do raise an interesting point in, in the comment about, you know, trying to lobby people in Wash in, in, on the Capitol, because most of them aren't there most of the time either. Um, and they're um, having to try to figure out how to do votes when they are scattered across the country or those who stayed in D.C. but stayed in their apartments, as most of them have some kind of residence in D.C., um, how do they do votes? Because they're technically supposed to be done in person. And so, you know, they have some capacity to change rules and so forth and do that. But it's been a very interesting process where you're used to having a lot of face-to-face -face contact on the Hill and you're just having so much less of that than what, that, what, you know, what you typically are. The same kind of social distancing that all of y'all are dealing with, they're dealing with on Capitol Hill as well. And that's causing some interesting processes to work through. Who's next? I see lots of, for those of you who just, I see Justin, CK, those who just joined, I'm doing mostly q and I did a, a, a two minute intro, which is probably a minute too long. And I just really interested in hearing y'all's comments and y'all's questions. Jeff, I have a question for you, Sam Tate. Hey, Ann. How are you? I'm well, thanks. Glad to see you doing this. I'm enjoying the things I'm coming to this, uh, today. Cool. I'm just wondering if you comment on the civility or sometimes the lack of civility during this election time and if you think it's appropriate or is this a sign of, is this something that's widely accepted or can you just comment on it for me? Yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> um, that, that's something I talk with my students about actually. Um, in, in some ways, the, the elections today are more civil than they were in the 1800s. 
Um, there would be allegations typically unsupported of a candidate being a drunkard or being a bigamist or all kinds of horrible things that people would say. And also during that time, of course, the media was completely unregulated. Um, if I owned a newspaper, it was my paper and it said whatever I wanted it to say. Um, and so sometimes in some ways it was worse, um, but it sort of, it, to some degree cleaned itself up in the 20th century. And then late 20th century, now into the 21st, we've gotten into this new realm of just, it's really less about trying to make the point of how good I am or how good my ideas are, and more about telling people just how horrible you are and how the world is going to go to heck in a handbasket if you get elected. Um, and that I think is bad. Um, I wish there was a way um, to, to sort of turn that back. Um, but it requires some individuals to make some, some hard choices. And um, at least to this point on the national scale, you, you unfortunately don't see a lot of folks doing that. It's sort of like, I know they're going to throw dirt, so I have to throw more if I'm going to win. And we could argue maybe the way to win is to say, you know, I'm not going to throw dirt at all. He, he or she can throw all they want. I'm going to choose not to throw any and just see what happens. Um, it works just and I see you're on here. It works fairly well, mostly in local elections. You see a lot less of that in local elections than you do in state. And of course, the most you see in the federal races. Um, but I would, you know, I would I would hope that we would see an improvement in that area because I don't think uh, it's good for our country. I think it, it certainly impacts uh, the youngest in our political system because that's what they've seen for most all of their lives. And they just see politics as this horrible thing and people just, you know, yell and scream at each other. So I don't know if Thank I answered you. that very well, but that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. I have a question. This is Candace Burris. I'm class of 94. I'm in Winston-Salem, actually. Okay. Okay. So oh, my okay. question. I find you for a second. There you are. Okay. <laughs> my question is, I was talking to a friend of mine and he kept insisting that should something go wrong and we don't get to vote, that Donald Trump can stop the election. Could you please talk about that? Um, yeah, there's been a lot of interesting, um, oh golly, let's, let's try to be nice. There's been lots of interesting comments made by folks, um, sometimes uh, by the media, especially local media who are not quite as knowledgeable. I mean. It, you know, typically you start local and move up and move up. So they're the youngest in many cases. And there was a question that one of the local stations, there was a call in and they were asked, well, you know, what happens if we don't have the election? You know, well, the election date is in the constitution. That's locked and loaded. Uh, the only way to change that is to amend the constitution. And since we've only done that 27 times in 230 years, I don't think that's a real likely thing to occur anytime soon. Um, so the, the November date is locked. Anything before that, though, you know, conventions or whatever, those things, uh, there are a lot of states that haven't even had their primaries yet, and, and they can have their primaries whenever they want to. That's, that's up to them. Um, but no, Trump can't stop the election. Um, there's nothing really he can do at this point. Um, there are a lot of folks um, who misunderstand the power of the president. And that's something he doesn't have any authority over whatsoever. So, okay. You feel better now? <laughs> oh, I felt fine. I was just, you know, I just <laughs> needed that reinforced. So that means that on January 20th, if something happens and there's no voting, which I don't think that'll happen either. Right. The president is Nancy Pelosi, right? According um, to the constitution. Well, That, that would be a constitutional crisis that actually the Supreme Court would end up deciding. Um, because if we don't have a vote, which again, I, that, that's, that's a scenario I don't see even a possibility for occurring. Right. So that, mm -hmm. that's everything after that sort of stops, at least in my head, uh, recognizing that, you know, in the universe in which we live, probably anything is possible. Uh, but I think the vote not taking place is is really not even a thought process for anybody. Um, um, 
Because, because the only, I mean, worst case scenario, the, the, the COVID-19 has, has an increase rather than what appears to be at least a leveling off, um, then, we, then we can change, every state can change how they do ballots and turn them to absentee ballots, to mail-in ballots. To, there are lots of things they can do because the voting process itself, every state determines how they want to do voting. Is, that, that's nothing, in, there's nothing in the constitution. Just the date is set in the constitution and that can't move again, unless we amend the constitution. So we're gonna have a vote. I don't have any doubt about that whatsoever. So I don't see Mrs. Pelosi becoming a president anytime soon. Whether that's good or bad, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Sure, absolutely. Jeff, we had a we had a question in the chat um, about uh, you sort of addressed a little bit about voting by mail and uh, mail in ballots, but as well as maybe the possibility of online voting. Do you think that's anything that might be coming down the pike at any point? Um, somewhere down the road, it's I would say it's possible. I think if we had if states had to make a shift. Um, it, for this election, the more tried and true method, if you will, would be some kind of absentee paper ballot that has been used in many, many states already. Uh, well, most every state does an absentee ballot on paper. Uh, some states do all their ballots every year, every election by paper ballot. Um, and there are lots of security issues with online voting uh, that, I, that states aren't prepared to handle um, at this point, you know, uh, somewhere and I really see this somewhere far down the road, we could see online voting as how every American votes in every state at some point, but I don't think that's anywhere close. So I think they would fall back to what's familiar, which would be the paper ballot and people either you know, having a drop off, for example, or people being able just to mail them back in as hundreds of thousands of Americans do every year for traditional uh, uh, mail-in ballots. Balance. Cool. Thanks, Sam. Professor, uh, this is John Easterling. I actually have a question. Hey, John. Uh, I hope you're well. I um, am. In regards to the campaigns of this year, how do you see those changing in regards to the COVID-19 crisis? You know, you know Dem the Democrats have pushed back, you know, their national convention. Right. Uh, even some pundits are calling against a question like, is there now a path to even like retaking the majority in the Senate just because of, you know, we're, we're just really dwindling down on campaigns just because of all the precautions that we take. Yeah. It, it's going to be an interesting campaign um, in part. And I had, had a brief comment several minutes ago, just about the nature of the campaign being so different because nobody can get out and campaign right now, it, not in person to person or not in group campaigning. You know, folks can do the internet, but, but even um, most political candidates, at least that I have seen, aren't doing a lot of even online campaigning at the moment. I think it's more of we're in a crisis. Let's, let's worry about the crisis first and, and not look like we're not caring and then move into um, election mode at some point. I think a critical element to this is by the time we hit September, October, where are we with the COVID virus? Um, because if we have managed to move through that and we're in fairly good shape, what kind of positive bump does that give to President Trump, for example? Um, or if things were to spurt in a negative direction, then what kind of impact does that have on his support in the country as well? Um, it does look, I mean, early, and again, this, this is April, we are seven months, I guess it is, away from the election. Um, you know, if the election were held today, Democrats probably take the Senate, barely, uh, probably expand their lead in the House, although not by a ton. Um, but that, but, you know, the good news for Republicans is that the election isn't today. It's seven months from now. And so there's a lot of things that can happen. Um, one of the interesting dynamics in the Senate is that there are, and th this happens every two years, it's just how the rotation of seats go. Um, four years ago, it was bad for the Democrats. Uh, this year, there are 12 seats that are up for election in the Senate, uh, which are considered to be vulnerable seats where the, where the race is tight. And 10 of those seats are being defended by Republicans and only two are Democrats. So the, just in and of itself, the odds are in the favor of Democrats gaining two or three seats. Um, but again, that's 
that's seven months away. So who knows what's going to happen between now and then. I like the way I keep bouncing around my screen. You're over here and then John's over there. I'm very, I'm very confused. So anyway, cool. Hope you're well, John. Hey, Professor. Yes. I got a question for you. First of all, I appreciate you doing this and then it's, it's good to see everyone here. Wish we could see everybody's faces. I know I see John and Justin and yeah. Sam, but um, my question is, uh, could, could you speak to the challenges that we currently face when it comes to balancing our individual liberties and our national security, especially at a time like this? Right. Um, you know, I, I had a friend, um, we, we go to church together, and we have some similar views and some very different views. And he put a post up on Facebook about the unconstitutionality of some of the decisions made by, by the president, some made by governors, you know, so forth. And, um, and when I, I didn't reply back to his, because I tend not to do that normally. Uh, but my thought was, you might well be correct that some of the decisions made, uh, some of the orders given might well be unconstitutional. And if they go to court, we'll, we'll know probably three years from now whether they were right or wrong. But that will be after the fact, you know, because they've done what they've done at this point. Um, it, is, it is a really, really hard philosophical choice. I will use this in my classes. I've got one class I teach that's sort of a political theory light class. And I guarantee you next semester, we'll be talking about the point you just raised. Uh, what is the balance between the freedoms that we have in our country and when you have what would have to be considered a national emergency of sorts, how much can you infringe on that freedom? Because uh, we, the governments have infringed on it pretty heavily. You know, telling citizens, you, for the most part, you have to stay home. Uh, that's a pretty serious cross of that line um, many folks would argue, yeah, but this is a pretty serious time for us to be dealing with. And so we need to take greater measures than we would normally allow. Others argue it's a, it's a, a step gone too far that we needed to, to not go as far as governors, mayors, the president in some cases did. Um, you know, for me, I'm more of, I guess if you're looking for personal, I'm more of the, this was a crisis. We have to do some things that we normally would not accept. Um, but I, clearly we, the government, government has stretched its power during this period of time. And it's good to see you as well. <laughs> You want to add back to that, Kay, or anybody else want to um, ask another question or whatever? So I, I had sort of a question um, about yeah. sort of, you've talked a lot about how we're in sort of unprecedented times here, but I wonder if there are any sort of historical uh, corollaries you could talk about as far as, you know, there's obviously been elections during wartime. Um, a lot of people have compared this occasion to being in a war or a battle. So I wonder if there's any historical analogies you could draw about maybe times we face something similar and sort of how those challenges were met at those at that time um briefly this this is one of those where i can i can take talk a little bit uh intelligently or knowledgeably knowledgeably i'm not sure intelligently um but but then others may know more than i and i'd be happy to listen to others speak as well um you can go back to the civil war with president lincoln uh, who's considered you know, either the first or second greatest president in American history and his suspension of the writ of habeas corpus. And there were, um, you know, Lincoln, I don't think uh, had any disaffection for the constitution, but he felt the crisis of the day, which was of course the civil war uh, was more significant and he had to do whatever he had to do to win the war and keep the country together. Um, during the great depression, um, President Roosevelt um, for a while was not able to exercise his powers very much because it was a very conservative Supreme Court and they kept limiting his powers. Um, later, the court uh, chose uh, to rule a bit differently and allow more of the New Deal programs come into existence. And there were some pieces of legislation uh, that were passed uh, that he used uh, to try to expand the, the federal government's power. In this case, you know, we're, we're trying to get out of the, out of the depression. And so, um, and then certainly during World War II, um, more pieces of legislation that were passed, 
but we know historically that President Roosevelt made uh, some number of arrangements with allied powers without any kind of Senate approval, in some cases without the government's knowledge. Um, again, e for either two things, A, if we can help them and avoid getting into the war, that's the best deal. And if it doesn't work that way, then when we get into it, we're already sort of set up and moving. Um, so there have been some sort of similar kinds of in uh, instances, but this is this is rather different because it is so much, you know, it, all, all three of those instances were, were two were wartime and then the third, the Great Depression, which, you know, nothing that we're dealing with now even remotely touches the Great Depression. Um, so that was just such a, a much more uh, difficult issue that you know the president felt the need to to expand uh, his actions, if you will. So, y'all ask great questions. Y'all need to sign up. For, some of y'all have been in my classes. The rest of y'all need to sign up in the fall. We got seats available. I can take y'all. So, except for Donigan, you can't be in my class. I don't know. So anyway. Oh. <laughs> Well, then I'll ask a question here since I can't be in your class. Uh, <laughs> okay. They've already let me online. Uh, thanks, Jeff, for doing this. We really appreciate it. Um, a little bit of a follow up to Kay's question. Do you think there will be significant, any significant uh, legislation to um, address some of the shortcomings we've had in addressing the pandemic? I mean, sort of like the disconnect that there existed at, uh, with 9 11 between the communication between. Uh, some of the, like the FBI and CIA and local jurisdictions, do you see any significant changes or an, in a, a constitutional amendment to address this kind of stuff? Golly, that's, that's, okay, you can take one of my classes. That, that was, that was a really good question. Um, let, let me, let me take the back end of your question first, and then, uh, th then I'll try to move forward. I don't, because and I mentioned this briefly with with another question earlier, I don't see any any amendment to the Constitution, um, as I shared earlier, and, and just to go into that just real quickly, uh, uh, just one minute longer. Um, since we wrote the Constitution, since the original draft was passed, we've had 27 amendments, 10 of those with Bill of Rights that were passed in the next three years. So for 220 whatever years, we've had 17 amendments. One of those put in prohibition, and one took out prohibition. So really 15 amendments. So anytime anybody says the phrase constitutional amendment to me, I just start shaking my head no, uh, because it's just not likely to occur. Um, whether I like the idea or not, yeah, I, don't, I don't think so. Um, I do hope, um, yeah, let me start with the hope and then I'll go to the think. I, I do hope that this crisis uh, brings us back to, uh, and this is not just a President Trump, this has gone on for a number of years. There's been fewer and fewer dollars um, compared to the larger federal budget given to National Institutes of Health, Center for Disease Control, those, those agencies um, have been sort of easy to cut some money back from. And I think, uh, and, and again, I'm hopeful that one of the outgrowths of this is that we'll recognize the need to to, to go back to those numbers and, and reinforce those agencies. Um, because certainly um, things could have been done a little bit differently if we'd known a little more or if they had had a little more to work with on the, on the front end. Um, um, do I think that will occur? My guess is as, as difficult as this has been for as many people, Probably at least on the short term, yes. Um, most crises we tend to react to um, in the moment. And then once the crisis is over, we sort of, man, crisis over, okay. And let's all go back to normal life and it doesn't have a lot of impact. Um, I'm hopeful that in this case, we'll have a bit of a different reaction um, and that there'll be a, a fairly bipartisan agreement that we need to, to put some dollars back into those health related issues. Um, and hopefully that will be helpful in the future. And in the same vein, to, to give a little more um, credence to people who work in those areas and listen to them when they talk um, because um, they know a part of the world that most of us have no knowledge of whatsoever uh, and don't want to. I mean, there's a reason why I majored in political science I don't want to know biology and chemistry and, you know, whatever, you know, 
uh, people who make those choices, uh, as I would hope sometimes people would listen to me from a political perspective, because I do know a couple of things. If I'm talking to a scientist and we're dealing with a scientific issue, I need, you know, I need to hush. Um, I was taught a long time ago a phrase that I've tried to live by. The person in the room who knows the most should be the one talking the most. And if I'm in a room with a scientist and we're talking about a scientific issue, I need to be quiet because I know it's not me. If it's me, we're in a really bad shape. Um, so hopefully we'll give them more resources and hopefully we'll give them more credence in the future. Professor Colbert. Thank you. Yeah. Similar to Donegan's question, what's your sense of the likelihood that we'll see an expansion of social safety net type programs as a result of this experience? So obviously North Carolina, the first time a lot of North Carolinians are collecting on unemployment insurance and perhaps getting a firsthand experience learning about whether or not those benefits are robust and should be greater than they generally are. Yeah. Yeah, that that's that's a I didn't teach you either, but you can come back if you want. I, that's a good. <laughs> um, let, let, let me answer that by telling the, by telling a quick story. And, and I tell this to, to most of my students in my classes back in the um, early golly, early 1980s. Um, I went through I, I was out of school at the time I dropped out of school. I worked. I, I lost that position. And for a, a several month period of time, I was on food stamps and unemployment. That was a life altering experience that I would, I am hopeful that I never forget what it was like. Because I remember quite distinctly going in, and that was the day when we had the food stamps, the coupon books, you, you pulled them out, they were colored. Um, and I, I remember distinctly the experience of having people look into my grocery cart to see what I was buying from their perspective with their money. And that was a, 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 well, the first time it happened, it was a shattering experience. Later I got sort of used to it. And eventually I got out of that world and got back to work and came back to school and you know, what it, life was good. Um, but I'm, I'm, all, I'm frankly grateful that I had to go through that because being in the system changed my perspective on people in the system. Um, now, that doesn't mean there aren't people there who shouldn't be there and there aren't people there who don't cheat the system and so forth. Um, but I had a, a great, res I gained a great respect for people who work in the system, as well as people who use the system as well. And I think, um, and, and certainly am hopeful that that transition will happen for a number of people that they'll, it, it, I mean, just the process of applying, although obviously with COVID, most people are applying online and not having to go to the social services office, which is what I had to do back in the 80s. But still the recognition that there are times when government has to help people and it's not because it's their fault. It's not because they did something wrong. Um, and just as that, mind, that mindset was greatly shaken by the Great Depression, I would be hopeful that that mindset would be maybe not greatly shaken, I'm not sure that's necessary, but it would it would get a good shake again that um, it, it, at the very least, we need to change some of our attitudes and thoughts about people who are in that universe. And secondly, we might want to think more seriously about what we're allocating into that part of the world um, and, and how we do it. You know, social workers don't get paid anywhere near enough money for the work they do. Um, that would be my first move. Let's pay those people like they deserve to be paid. And then let's go into the, how do we give more assistance to more folks? You know, because we, if we have more social workers, then we have a better chance of, of finding the people who need help and giving them help. Because uh, social workers are just overwhelmed on a regular basis. So, Professor Colbert, can I give, can I say one comment to that too? No. Yeah, of course you can. Yeah. yeah. Please, Hannah. No, I would just, I would just say from political perspective that it really kind of to Donegan's point too I think it just depends on how the election goes in in November not just federal elections but also state local elections and you know how that's going to go I would say even for like states that haven't expanded Medicaid yet that's very important who wins elections and whether you've sure. done that things like that so yeah it, it, you know and then on the congressional front I think I don't know about legislation necessarily to you know, 
whatever they think has gone on, but I think we can look forward to a lot more committee hearings and commissions and, you know, bureaucratic processes about what happened. Yeah, committees have not been as active the last two or three years as they typically are, so it would be nice to get more movement going there as well. But also, Justin, just to, just to come back, one more quick point that I, I thought of while Hannah was talking, uh, and this thought struck me the other day, whoever the next president is, we are adding literally trillions of dollars to the federal debt. Now, for some folks, that is just a, you know, start screaming and run out the door kind of thing. For other folks, it's okay, you know. And a lot depends upon who wins in November and how they choose to handle that. Is it going to be, well, yeah, we added $3 trillion, but it was an emergency. We're not going to slash the budget and try to make it up this year. Or is it going to be, okay, we solved the crisis. Now we got to make the money back and, and cut down the debt. So that, that would damage any possibility of adding to social service dollars. No. Uh, Y'all are great. Professor, actually, I do have a, another question out of curiosity. Oh, um, so post-COVID-19, um, this is more of a question focused on foreign policy, but what does this mean for like U.S.-China relations after this? You know, everyone's busy right now, so no one's really paying attention to that aspect, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that's probably going to be a topic of discussion for uh, this administration. Well, let me, let me make two responses. First, you should know from class that me and foreign policy don't have the best relationship with each other. So let me start with that sentence first, just you know, trying to be honest. Um, my guess is if President Trump is reelected, it would not have a dramatic impact on the relationship. Um, he is um, making, and I don't mean this as a partisan comment, it's just a fact, um, he's making a lot of political hay by calling this the China virus and those kinds of things. But I think that's more a political ploy because when you ask him or when, when, when reporters ask him about the leader of China, he typically starts moving into glowing terms about, you know, I, I like him, I know him, we have a great relationship, you know, those kinds of things. So, so based on that, my guess would be, um, and, and that's the proper word for me to use, that uh, if Trump is reelected, I don't think it really has a big negative impact. I don't think it has negative impact on our relationship with China. Uh, if Biden is elected, um, I don't think he has as favorable a view uh, of, the, of the Chinese leadership as the president does. And that could probably end up having some kind of, some kind of uh, a more negative impact if, uh, if Vice President Biden is elected uh, to office. And I'll close with saying, remember, I don't know foreign policy all that well. So it's just, <laughs> it's, not, it's not my best universe. Uh, who's next? Okay, Professor, not, this is not quite full-blown foreign policy, but it's close. Ouch. So um, my, my, my question was, you know, obviously this pandemic has exposed our vulnerabilities, especially when it comes to our national security. How do we fix that? Honestly, I think other than trying to be a little, putting, putting more money into the scientific universe that I had talked about, you know, you, you've been here like, like five minutes ago or whatever. Um, perhaps changing some elements in our national security net in terms of what we're looking at in other countries. Beyond that, I'm not sure there's very much we can, or at least that we're willing to do. Um, part of who we are is that we are a wide open society that lets practically anybody come in at practically any time. Um, and I think it's, it's difficult for us to back very far away from that without backing away from who we are as a country. Um, I could be absolutely be wrong, but my guess is that we would not see a lot of changes um, from that perspective other than the two that I talked about. Because um, even in this instance in early January, I think it was, if my memory is correct, um, President Trump was getting at least some initial advice from the national security um, advisors about there's something going on in China. We're not getting all the info, but it looks like it could be an issue. Um, 
Now, whether they were monitoring for that or whether they, you know, frankly fell across the info, I don't, that I don't know enough to be able to talk about. Um, but, you know, we're getting some information, but I, don't, I think our science was was not as supported as it could be. Um, and, you know, but, but in the larger sense, uh, that's a really great question, but I just don't see us changing, the, that, that would almost change the fabric of who we are. And I, I just don't see us doing much in that area. I could be wrong. <laughs> Hopefully you won't, <are> right? <laughs> I see Elizabeth leaning forward. She needs to ask a question or show me her kid, one or the other. I don't care which. <laughs> How are you doing, Elizabeth? Uh, trying to unmute. There we go. Um, there you go. Yeah, no, uh, doing good. My kid is uh, still in daycare, if you can believe it. Whoosh. Um, yeah, reduced hours, and they take his temperature every day, but okay, still in daycare, so um, I'm able to work from home. Cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, and that's what I'm what I'm doing right now. Yeah. <laughs> Wait a minute. For those of you who don't know Elizabeth, she is you're an alumnus. Yes. And currently in yeah. grad school, right? Well, starting in the fall, allegedly. Okay. And works in the School of Nursing. And so mm -hmm. we met mm -hmm. about, a, I don't know, a few months ago, I guess. Uh-huh. So, cool. Yeah, very different times then. Yeah, very true. Yeah. We'd actually <laughs> be in the same room within three feet of each other. I know, right. It sounds crazy when you say it now. Yeah, very true. It's good to see you. Yeah, likewise. Cool. Any other questions? Jeff, I have not necessarily a question okay. um a, more of a prompt share your thoughts about um the focus or, or refocus uh, the, that's sort of been put on states rights versus the federal government it's been some interesting back and forth goodness i could talk for 30 seconds or six hours um i'll pick the 30 <laughs> uh, well i'll do more than 30 seconds but there you go. um yeah, it's my, actually my wife and I were chatting. Um, uh, we were watching uh, President Trump um, as he was, you know, unveiling his plan for opening the country back up. Um, and again, it's not a partisan comment. It's just, you know, I, I deal with as much as I can with facts. Um, he wasn't the one who shut the country down. The governors did that. Um, and so the ones who will open the country back up are the governors. Um, and I think of all the presidents that we have had in my lifetime, President Trump, either either of two things, and, and I don't know him obviously at all as, as an individual, either he is the president who has had the least understanding of what our constitution actually says, or he speaks poorly about what he knows about what the constitution says. Because um, there are things that I know a lot about and sometimes I'll be in a, not a forum like this, but I'm in front of a class, and I'll say something and I'll think later, oh, that was a really dumb way to say that. That and sometimes the next class I go in and go, you know, that thing I said last went, that was wrong. Okay, let me let me come back in and reset this. Um, because he made a statement last week about, you know, I'm the president. When you're the president, you you make all the decisions. Well, no, not in our country. You know, there are there are 150 countries in the world where that's true, but we're not one of them. Um, we have a very different kind of system. Um and I think it'll be interesting to see just how many states feel as though they need to, because because where President Trump and every president has this capacity is, is to use the, the, the presidency as has been called for decades and decades as the bully pulpit to try to encourage governors. You know, it's time now to unleash, at least in some modified ways. Um, and that's a very different thing from, from essentially ordering people to do something which he doesn't have the authority to do. Uh, in fact, when I talk about the presidency in my American government class, uh, we spend some time talking about the, the question of, is the American president the most powerful secular leader on the planet? And the answer depends on how you define power. Because if you define power as the way to make something happen, I order Dean to do something, he has to go do it, then he is way down the list of world leaders in terms of power, because there aren't many things that he can do. But if he, if you're talking about the, 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 the apparatus that he has to work with, I mean, we are the most powerful country on the planet. 
Uh, that wasn't true 75 years ago. It may not be true 25 years from now. That's not a flag wave, waving comment. That's, again, that's a fact. We're the most powerful country on the planet. So if a president can get the country moving in a direction, he is clearly the most powerful leader on the planet. It just, it depends on how you define it. Um, and I think what's been interesting has been, um, and I, I, I will give President Trump great credit for this, he has spent a lot of time talking to governors. Uh, he is not, not daily, but he very frequently talks about have, being on a conference call or you know, having a probably a Zoom meeting like this with the governors. And um, I think there's been a fair amount of communication between them, uh, which, which again, I give him credit for uh, because that's what he needed to do. It was the right thing to do. Um, and I think, you know, but part of the problem also comes in, there's a lot of federal money that's now flowing into the states. And if, you know, one of, the, one of these sort of truths of government is if I give you money, I'm going to make you do something for it somewhere down the road. Um, and that, that is a place where I think states have to be very, very careful in that state-federal relationship. Um, and if, um, you know, it, because this is a short-term issue, at least we, we hope and pray it is, uh, that may not have as great an impact on that. Um, but, you know, if that money keeps, that's one of the downsides of money coming from the federal government, it seldom comes for free. There's almost always an attachment to it of some sort, which I, which I understand. I don't, it's not necessarily a criticism. It's just, it's just a reality. Right. Great. Thanks, Jeff. Sure. Sure. Ellen. Yeah, I see that hand waving. Can you unmute so I can hear you? Okay. Uh, well, I'm I'm one of those political science majors from the last century at U. <laughs> <laughs> what year did you graduate? 1955. Oh my goodness gracious! I was blessed to see you. 55 years ago. Good deal. I think you talked about. I tried to get in a little bit earlier, so it's going backwards. But okay, you talked about us not having the money in the science world yes, supporting our what we have mm -hmm. um we did have a group of people though who were still working on how to do it when it happened yes and mr trump dismissed them all therefore he didn't have anything to begin when this hat started and he was very late in getting started because he didn't want to admit that it was happening I think. Um, and I wish somebody along the way would get us back to having the task force reports to be task force reports and not Trump rallies. Well, you make, you make two really good points. Let me try to address, address both of them. Um, and I would do again reverse order. Uh, I, 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 do, I do agree with you. And, th and again, this would be true. I wouldn't care if it was Barack Obama, Bill Clinton, George W. Bush. Um, if we're going to have a task report that, I'm, that I feel in part because I'm a political scientist and in part because I'm an American citizen, I'd rather just hear the report rather than okay. everything else That's right. that, attach that attaches to it. Um, so I totally understand that. Um, I think that's true of a lot of, of politicians that they, whatever venue they have, they take advantage of that um, and probably spend more time talking about it. Although Trump does seem to have turned it into an art form, uh, to be honest. Um, and, he, and he has now talking about putting more money in, he's withdrawing from the World Health Organization. Mm. He's taking that money away. Yes, yeah. And, and, and that, that would be a third point. So <laughs> hang, hang on to that thought for a second. Um, yeah, there, there's been a little bit of misunderstanding, a little bit of misreporting about his, his is what, what they really did in the White House was they re revamped all those offices. Um, and while there was a specific office set aside for pandemics, medical emergencies, you know, uh, those kinds of things, they sort of got subsumed under somebody else. But a number of people were let go. And that office did not have the same prominence just simply because it was now. Well, it was just an empty else. office. It I'm sorry. Just an empty, it was just an empty office. 
Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And they just sort of put it under, you know, another existing piece. Those um, people were given other jobs. Yes. Fired yeah. One yeah. Or the other. And, and that certainly, you know, every president reorganizes his offices to, in some way. And that in hindsight certainly was a, 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 at least I would argue from the result, that was probably a, a bad decision to make. Um, I don't imagine any of us three and a half years ago would have predicted a pandemic taking place. Um, but again, I am a person who, while science is not my universe, I recognize the value of it. And I, you know, I think it was, regardless of seeing a pandemic coming, I thought, I thought it was a bad choice for them to make. Um, and then the decision to, to withhold money from the World Health, World Health Organization, um, that's another whole political can of worms. Um, and whether that will be a temporary hold, because he's done things like this before, <laughs> and then two months later, release the dollars, you know, sort mm -hmm. of a political, uh, or a, I need to make a point with you, you know, and then later release the dollars uh, to hopefully, from his perspective, hopefully get his point across to the agency. Um, so whether those dollars will be permanently withheld or not, I'm sort of doubtful. My guess is some of those money, the, at, at least some of those dollars will eventually get released to go to the World Health Organization. But at least for the moment, they're, they're not going there. And we, hold, we, we support them significantly. So that would be a big difference if, if it was permanent. Um, good questions, Alan. Thanks. <laughs> 55. Wow, that's so amazing. I need, we need to say, where, hey, do you live Dr. in the area? I'm, a, I'm a, a student of Dr. Alexander. Wow. Harriet Alexander. Yes. And you and I need to talk sometime. So cool. It's nice to see you. Thanks for coming in. Thank you. I see Ms. Irvin over there. So how are you doing? Oh, she's muted too. Now I'm unmuted. <laughs> how are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm sorry I missed the very beginning because I wanted to kind of get your your take on on where we're headed in your opinion. I don't Just know that I even forward, said that. <laughs> you know, and with the election, particularly yeah. the ones campaigning, um, and I did not get to hear that in the beginning. So I'm, I'm sure you would be saying again what you've said before. <laughs> Well, my students will tell you I do that on a regular basis, actually. So, you know, when you have nothing to say, just repeat yourself. It's okay. Half of them were taking notes the first time so they can get it second time around, you know. Um, no, it, it, actually, what I said at the beginning, I, I did nothing. Well, I did very little predictive um, because it was talking. I was talking more about just how unusual this campaign has been and will continue to be, at least for some period of time, um, because obviously we can't have any in-person campaigning. We can't have any group rallies and stuff. Um, and, and I think for most political candidates, uh, Ellen's point about, um, about the, 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 uh, the virus updates is, is on. But beyond that, even President Trump and certainly Vice President Biden have done very little campaigning um, and they really can't do much right now because it would, just, it would be unseemly to do that at the moment. And so they're, they're choosing not to. Um, what will be critical, um, and the, I think it's about the only other thing I said about the election specifically, is just when we get to where we can have more campaign activity taking place and how that's going to look um, and what kind of impact, you know, as, as I think one, the other comment I made was if it depends on how we come out of the, corona, the coronavirus issue. Uh, if we manage to get this resolved in a relatively short period of time, uh, with a with a more limited number of infections and deaths than anticipated, that probably helps President Trump. Uh, if we start, as, as he is encouraging us to start sort of easing up, and then we have another wave of infections and deaths, that probably doesn't help his campaign uh, um, likelihood at all. Um, but it's just hard to figure at this point. Th this is the most, I mean, I'm, I tend not to predict stuff anyway. That's just not much of what I do. But this is as unpredictable in April as I have ever involved. And I've been watching, I was born in 52, the first election, and I watched the election was when I was eight and the Kennedy-Nixon campaign. Um, so I've seen a lot of elections in my lifetime. And this is, this is as weird a one 
and as unpredictable at this point as we could possibly imagine. Well, and I think too, when you look at the governor's race as well, you have Roy Cooper with a pulpit right now and you have Dan Forrest um, somewhere drifting yeah. <laughs> on the sidelines. So, you know, I, I wonder what kind of impact this will have because it'll be a much shorter period of time in which to campaign and, yeah. you know, and you could also hope that perhaps it might be a little more positive than it would be negative. And I would like to think that on all levels, we back away from the negativity, but I don't know that I see that. Yeah, there, there was a question at the very beginning about that. And I have a, I have, I have the same hope, but a, a similar um, lack of um, uh, confidence that there'll be any real change in that. Uh, it certainly doesn't, on the governor's level, uh, it does give incumbents a real leg up. Um, and especially if they can avoid saying anything that's incorrect, avoid saying anything inflammatory, which at least at this point, um, by my analysis, Governor Cooper has been able to do. Um, so it, I think it does give incumbents a bit of a leg up at this stage. Um, but again, if, if things sort of reasonably settle down, let's say by midsummer, that gives a good five months of campaigning uh, for, in this case, for Dan Forrest and, and you know, Joe Biden on the national level and other folks as well. Which again, thank is you part for of what repeating makes it just yourself. Weird. I'm sorry. Thank you for repeating yourself for me I, since I missed the beginning. <laughs> That's perfectly okay. You be you trying to yeah raise your hand. I, I hear I see I've got like two minutes left or something. So it's ask. You know, I was just going to prompt you to that. Uh, just trying to wrap up comments uh, questions. Uh, we just have about five more minutes uh, until four o'clock hits. But if you have any other questions or want to reach out to us. Uh, go to our alumni page and email us alumni.uncg.edu and we are happy to forward those questions to Jeff. So yeah. thank you so much for joining us. It's been my pleasure. It was great. Are there still a couple of minutes left? Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, we yes, have, we, we have, have a couple yeah. for. Okay, um, can I ask a question? Sure. Um, uh, can you evaluate the the makeup of the cabinet and the revolving door and how so many of his advisors are, advisors are no long, haven't been approved by Congress. Um, they're in and out. They've gotten rid of so many talented career politicians and how vulnerable that makes the United States at that point. And our um, I have, I have talked, um, as I have, as, as I have taught my classes dur during the three years President Trump's been in office, I have talked a little bit uh, about the unusual nature of that revolving door in his camp, in his uh, um, uh, term in office. Uh, it is not unusual for a certain number of people to come and go because a lot of people come in and they find out what it's like to work in DC and they really don't want to do that very long. And so they get out after a couple of years, three years. But his, um, in terms of cabinet secretaries and close advisors, uh, he has had a, a much um, higher rate of turnover than we typically see, especially in the first term of office. Um, and in some cases, I do think that's problematic. And I would say that regardless of who the president was, uh, because if you, if you don't have your slots filled, you're just not getting the advice that you need from the number of people you need it from. And typically those folks um, are, are quite knowledgeable in policy areas. Uh, and, and that's important because no president can be knowledgeable about everything. So you have to have people who are policy specialists who can give you information and advice. And, and then you take it or not, that's up. It's still the president's decision, but you need folks who can give you the information that you need. Um, and um, I don't know if it's necessarily hurt us badly at this point, but it is something during his, um, during his uh, time in office that has concerned me about the number of folks uh, that have, have, have left his administration either on their own or because he, uh, decided to remove them because there's a fair amount of both. Thank you. Sure, absolutely. Good to see you again, Ann. Good to see you too. All righty. You got to Texas out of time, that. doesn't it? Are, are we out of time now or right at it? Right at it. We got about two more minutes. Anyone want to, you know, jump in, make a comment or two or question and wrap it up? We've got two minutes. Okay, Jeff, Jeff, you can do closing comments. Lord. I was going to say, give your comments on the the Senate race and then the likelihood of what's going to happen to 
Burr, given all of the the news happening around that too. It's interesting time for senators from North Carolina. So. <laughs> I, I think well, North Carolina is considered one of the seats where there is a yeah. good shot for Democrats to take and then be as part of that, take back the Senate as well. Um, I, I, as I said, I don't do a lot of predicting. If I had to put money on something, I, I would put money that the Democrats are gonna take the North Carolina seat back. Um, I think the Democrats will take the Senate, although I think it'll be barely 50-50, maybe 51-49, but they've gotta have a lot of luck to do that much. Um, they'll keep the House, of course, and probably expand their, their, their margin there. Um, but again, um, I, I could give you a list of predictions I've made in the last 30 years, and most of them would make you just crack up because uh, they were so badly wrong. Um, so, you know, if you're a Democrat going, yeah, don't get excited. OK, just don't get too excited. Um, but it'll, it'll be, it's, it's a fascinating year to watch. It's one of the reasons why I love politics so much. Uh, you know, two plus two is always four if you're an accountant. If you're a political scientist, every day you wake up, your universe just shifted and you got more stuff to talk about. So mm -hmm. I love it. For a while, I love my world. So cool. Anyway, so y'all take care. It's good to thank y'all so much for coming. I had this view of me talking to Mary for like 20 minutes or whatever. And I'm so, so appreciative of y'all being here. Uh, you are what makes this university work. You know, we're not anything without you guys. So thanks for being here. You made my afternoon very enjoyable. I appreciate it. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks, Jeff. See y'all. Y'all take care. Bye, Bye everyone. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye.